Hi folks, I would like to follow up in this last web lecture on themes started in class on November 18th on uh, human evolutionary medicine but not completed and this uh, should stand alone as a web lecture. One of the most interesting topics in this course, particularly for those of you interested in careers in medicine, is how evolutionary thinking can influence the way we practice medicine. So a key point and why I want to focus on are different explanations for why humans are vulnerable to disease. Colloquially, I will frequently say that our study of evolution is the why in all of biology. We can't answer questions of why in biology without resorting to evolution. So even those who may have religious beliefs that lead them to question evolution, if they resort to why, if they're making any explanation that is not because I said so or because someone else said so, it's ultimately an evolutionary explanation. And in medicine, why is really important. <laughs> if we care about actually making people better instead of making them feel better while they die, we have to practice intelligent, thoughtful medicine and understand why diseases happen. And those are ultimately evolutionary explanations. There's no place in biology where evolution is more important than in medicine. So we can roughly, there may be others, but there are at least six explanations for why diseases happen. One for communicable diseases caused by pathogens is that they evolve more quickly than their hosts. Pathogens have frequently very short reproductive times from uh, the order of minutes, say 20 minutes in E. coli, uh, to a handful of days or weeks, while humans may take 15 to 30 years to reproduce. A second explanation is that natural se selection lags behind environmental change. If we think about this in terms of humans, it was only maybe 40 generations ago, if not three generations ago, that most of us lived on farms, and maybe 40 to 400 that most of us were hunter-gatherers, while now the vast majority of people on the planet either live on farms or in cities, and increasingly you know, just in cities or suburban areas. This is vastly different than the place where most natural selection has acted. So for traits under weak natural selection, uh, it, it simply lags behind massive changes in human behavior and biology that have occurred in recent generations, uh, given our long generation time. We can also look at this as climate change, but really, and I didn't emphasize this sufficiently in class, this is about sort of drastic changes in human diet uh, and living standards from agriculture and from cities. A third explanation is that trade-offs make it nearly impossible for natural selection to solve certain biological problems. We can think of this as, say, proteins involved in defense, parts of the immune system that may be effective at one disease and not effective at another. Uh, a good example that I gave in class is the CCR5 Delta 32 allele, uh, where uh, mutations that confer resistance to HIV may increase susceptibility to typhoid or West Nile virus. Uh, so the, this is one form of trade-off, but there are others where uh, perhaps uh, resistance against one kind or category of disease, say um, uh, a gut pathogen, may actually make one more susceptible to, say, a uh, respiratory pathogen. A fourth explanation is that evolutionary history puts constraints on changes that natural selection can bring about. One way of looking at this is, say, in marsupials, like kangaroos, where as infants that have to uh, go into the maternal sac, uh, they need uh, arms that can act early in life. But this limits the capacity of the arms of marsupials, particularly in uh, the kangaroo, uh, wallaroo, wallaby lineage, uh, to take on other forms. So this gives some of the sort of strange biology to organisms like kangaroos because their arms have to function early in life. But there are other cases where uh, this uh, might matter in, say, humans. So one of these is that we are a primate, and many primates have a, hev a diet heavily focused on fruit. Fruit are highly nutritious. Among other things, they're usually very high in vitamin C. And I believe all primates, if not most primates, lack the en uh, functional enzymes for the metabolism of 
uh, for, for the uh, generation of vitamin C. So we have to get vitamin C in our diet, otherwise we get a disease called scurvy. Many other organisms, organisms actually don't require, many other animals don't require vitamin C in their diet. Uh, it's actually really restricted to primates and a few other groups where that capacity has been lost. So that's just a, a function of us being primates. It would actually be fairly simple to fix in that the genes actually exist in our genome. They just happen to be pseudogenes and not functional. So you could engineer a human to be resistant to scurvy. And this is a matter of, um, besides sort of the science fiction part of this, this is a matter of our evolutionary history of us being primates. A fifth explanation is that some traits increase reproductive fitness at the cost of causing disease. So an example I gave in class is that an explanation for Huntington's disease is that people with it, although they suffer a, a quite difficult, painful death, uh, uh, losing the capacity to think, to eat, to move, uh, it may increase fitness earlier in life or sort of reproductive success. You could argue that some traits, particularly as expressed in men, sort of macho traits, uh, extreme masculinity, also increase reproductive fitness but lead to earlier death. And a sixth explanation is that some traits that we now view as disease may actually have at once been an adaptation. An example I gave is diabetes, where uh, in the past, when food was more limiting than it is in most Western diets now, some genotypes or genetic backgrounds in humans may have been more resistant to starvation because they had a thriftier metabolism. Uh, but in times of excessive uh, access to calories, uh, this leads to greater susceptibility to a disease like diabetes. So it was once an adaptation, but it is now uh, manifested as a disease. Others are uh, sickle cell anemia, where it does cause uh, sickle celling and has uh, issues for performance, uh, for endurance, uh, under particular conditions, but it is a clear adaptation to malaria. All right, so I asked you in class to pick a disease and discuss some of these explanations. If you haven't done it, it's a good opportunity to do it, and I would encourage you to pick others. It is, in a way, might be a little dorky. I am certainly dorky, a fun activity. All right. A point I did not get to in class, uh, but I've gotten to in other web lectures, is that po pathogens evolve within a single host. This course's very first web lecture on HIV had an example of this. But this is true of many diseases. It's true of the flu. Uh, it's true of bacterial diseases as well. And virulence in many pathogens varies between pairs of hosts. So some pathogens are more virulent uh, they're more easily transmitted and they cause greater uh, consequences in the host. And there's really an important trade-off here. For many pathogens, virulence, uh, making the host sick, that is what virulence is, uh, is important for making it transmittable. Uh, so this is particularly true of, say, respiratory diseases, where uh, the respiratory infection is what essentially causes it, sneezing and coughing, to be dispersed. For some hemorrhagic diseases, uh, sort of the disruption of bodily organs actually causes the transmission as well. And even in some uh, diseases like mad cow and kuru, where uh, it's eating the brain that transmits the, the pathogen, uh, in, in those cases, the virulence is likely part of it, sort of killing the host to get it transmitted. But depending on uh, the disease, th there's a trade-off here. And in many diseases, making the host too sick kills it before it may even be transmitted. So in a lot of flu cases, particularly if you get something like bird flu, where it uh, hasn't yet adapted to humans, it can be so virulent that it kills the host before it's transmitted. And a lot of uh, mosquito-borne or vector-borne diseases have this problem. Disease like malaria does put people in bed, by and large, uh, where they're more easily bitten and perhaps transmits it more, but if it makes them too sick, uh, it can change that. Now, th this is a place where there's a lot of potential for rapid evolution. Pathogens do have high mutation rates and re uh, high reproductive rates, so uh, they can evolve very quickly. And public health practices can really influence this by changing the dynamics under which the pathogen is transmitted. So things like quarantines really can work. 
but it depends on the nature of the pathogen and the we really need to understand a disease to effectively stop it. Okay, another place where evolutionary thinking is really important is in managing antibiotics. We have an amazing tool that in many ways is we waste in our current culture. We know that antibiotic can, resistance can evolve quickly. It can even evolve in a single patient who repeatedly takes uh, an antibacterial uh, treatment. It's clear that increased use of bacteria, uh, of antibiotics, leads to increased resistance in bacteria. Even the staunchest uh, creationists usually acknowledge this. Uh, and data like this shown here is clear, persistent, if not obvious evidence of evolution in practice. And ultimately, the sad fate is that most antibiotics are short-lived. They simply don't last that long because they're really powerful at first. We have an obligation, an, an ethical obligation as caregivers to use them, and that reduces their effectiveness. So you can see that different classes of antibiotics, from antimalarials to antibacterials uh, to things used for tuberculosis, which is a particularly virulent bacterial pathogen, to antiretrovirals have all lost their effectiveness quite quickly. Some have lasted longer than others, uh, but all of them will ultimately lose their effectiveness. If it's not clear, we have a, a serious challenge here where in the US we use at least half, if not much more, of our antibiotics in livestock, usually in livestock that are not sick. It's actually the vast majority of it goes to livestock that aren't sick, simply as standard production practices. This is a practice we must stop. It's a threat to all of us, and whatever one's background, there's no reason that farmers uh, should be putting the rest of society at risk uh, for this practice. All right, so antibiotic resistance evolves very rapidly because bacteria in particular, but also viruses, can acquire mutations. And in bacteria in particular, with horizontal gene transfer, this is a risk. And we really have to understand sort of evolutionary history and the biology of these pathogens to develop effective treatment options. Another thing that's been observed in a range of pathogens is co-speciation, where as lineages diverge, so do the pathogens they carry. This is true of a lot of close symbionts and agonists, but it's uh, true of many pathogens, where we can see different groups and different um, See, see sister uh, pathogens in sister species. So th this in can indicate long evolutionary associations. And in many cases, these associations have fairly limited virulence. They're not that serious of diseases. But one thing that can happen is that these diseases, as we have greater contact with different animals, as we, as humans, move into their habitats, we, we may acquire them. So there are um, a number of diseases like this. Ebola, I've already given a lecture on a, a web lecture on Ebola. But another example is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome that was discovered in Saudi Arabia in 2012. And when it first arose, it had a 30% fatality rate. We had an important question, where did it come from? Well, somewhat similar to Ebola, it likely originated in bats and was then transmitted to camels and then on to humans. Uh, so this uh, evolutionary history as it moves to humans means it's not well adapted to us. And one sign of that can be very high virulence, particularly in the first infected individuals. We have a number of zoonotic diseases that have moved from animals to humans. Arguably, most of our contagious diseases did not originate in humans, but started in animals from uh, cowpox uh, and smallpox, uh, chickenpox, uh, but e even uh, measles and certainly the flu. And there are a number of examples, if not most uh, diseases have some contagious diseases have this sort of uh, history. Understanding this can help us uh, make effective vaccines against these um, emerging pathogens, but it, it takes considerable investment. All right, so this is a place where evolutionary thinking is critical. Phylogenetic tools are essentially the way that we reveal the source of emerging infections, and it can help us predict outbreaks, intervention methods, and effective controls. So I talked a little bit in class about the flu, and I want to spend some more time on it. 
It's a fascinating and simple virus and quite deadly. It's transmitted uh, aerially. That makes it uh, uh, quite capable of spreading quickly, uh, almost explosively. And it's a, a virus that evolves extremely rapidly, so rapidly that we have to develop a new vaccine for it on nearly a yearly basis uh, to have effective and not even perfect control of it. And this is because it's it simply the epitopes, the sort of the surface proteins, evolve so quickly that they're almost unrecognizable year to year. And part of how it does this is by viral reassortment, particularly between bird, uh, other mammal, and human strains. Uh, and when they recombine, you can get highly pathogenic strains. Crowding conditions that many of us live in are, can particularly uh, push this forward. The worst outbreak of the flu occurred in 1917, 1918, 1919, during the peak uh, and immediate aftermath of World War I, when conditions were particularly crowded. Uh, but in an increasingly urban world, we still have these crowded conditions in airports, in refugee camps, uh, and elsewhere that are particularly prone to these sorts of outbreaks. And in many cases, it may only take a few generations for a virus uh, like the flu to evolve from one host to another. So different strains of the flu may quickly um, evolve to uh, be transmitted in a new host. All right, so uh, if you have uh, the motivation, reading about the 1918 flu outbreak uh, is fascinating. Uh, it tells us a lot about the science of the time and some of the threats we face in the future, and simply how grim, uh, particularly that war, but war in general was. All right. we, we live in an age of worldwide travel, and it, its impact on pathogens should not be um, minimized. Uh, we can uh, manage some of these uh, risks, uh, but you know, they're, they're simply a fact of our modern world. Another point is that our immune system co-evolves with pathogens. So a great example of this is sickle cell anemia. Many of you are familiar with this. The sickle cell alleles are at high frequency in areas of endemic uh, malaria. Uh, and, and parasites like malaria can exert really strong selection pressure on hosts. And the sickle cell trait shows that some of these adaptations may not be perfect. Uh, and sickle cell, the sickle cell trait is hardly a perfect adaptation to coping with malaria. Another issue in human history is that many populations have been through severe bottlenecks, and there are genetic diseases that are often unique to particular populations. Uh, the Amish and some of the other uh, originally German uh, religious groups in the U.S., uh, concentrated in places like Pennsylvania, have been through some of the more extreme bottlenecks, and they're susceptible to a range of genetic diseases like uh, maple syrup urine disease. Uh, so this is uh, both interesting, it can help us do medicine in particular populations, but also affects how some drugs are metabolized in different populations. So now that we've moved into an era where the tools to look at genetic variation in different populations are available, we can really start to uh, deal with some of these uh, diseases on a personalized basis. So one of the futures of medicine will be a personal medicine, where we sequence a, an individual and then develop treatments suitable to that particular individual. So uh, many of you will make your careers in understanding the genetic variation in an individual to develop treatments. We're a few years away from this, but uh, this is like plastics in the 1960s. It's a good time to get in on the ground floor. Another place where evolutionary thinking can be useful is in understanding aging. We live in an increasingly old society where um, we have uh, a far different distribution of ages and many more old people than we have in the past. And uh, part of explaining aging is as a trade-off between functioning in youth uh, and uh, longevity. So we can think of aging as a pleiotropic byproduct, and that means a, a multi-factored product of selection on other age classes, of getting through childhood, of infancy, childhood, uh, and early adulthood. 
Another place where evolutionary thinking has been increasingly common is in dealing with cancer. There are some genes uh, that uh, in their sort of normal or wild type state um, are known to be able to cause cancer if they're mutated. And once mutations occur in these genes, like uh, p53 uh, is a classic example of this, uh, the BRCA1 genes are an example of this, the mutated versions move on to cause cancer. And similar mutations happen independently in these. They don't have to happen in the germline, but can happen in any cell, and, and they can lead to the growth of, of a cancer's tissue. But cancer is not usually just one mutation, it happens to be several. And what happens is, as, cell div as the controls on self-division are lost through mutation, uh, cells that can divide start to, and as uh, they start to proliferate, we may, now that we have the tools to do it, catch them, treat them, and many forms of treating cancer, chemotherapy, chemotherapy radiation, some of the more advanced new uh, drugs that target um, angiogenesis, all of these tools are essentially targeted at dividing cells, essentially cancer cells. And they'll remove many of these cells, but a few cancer cells may linger. And they're a subset of these. So it's worth noting that in a cancer, not all of the cells are the same. Different lineages of cells in the cancer will accumulate new mutations. So what this uh, chart is showing us is that uh, different cell lines accumulate new different mutations that may or may not make that are likely to make them more aggressive, um, more likely to divide or even to migrate to other parts of the body. Uh, so in a number of cancers, uh, particularly say uh, the melanoma that my grandmother has, what makes it dangerous is when it moves from one part of the body to another. Uh, or a close family friend died of a melanoma that started in her eye, of all places, and then migrated throughout her body. So a as a cancer accumulates new mutations, it it's useful as a means of controlling it to look at it as a population. And as we treat it, we're going to impose selection on that population, and some lineages of those cells may survive with different mutations than those at the beginning uh, that may lead to different parts of this. So this makes um, relapse so dangerous. So in some cancers, removing the tissue is really, the entire tissue is really the best way to go. Uh, this is part of what makes breast cancers so challenging to deal with, because, or prostate cancers, because they involve tissues that are, are, are so dear to our identities. But we're removing them real, in some cases, and this is not necessarily my opinion and should be fully the opinion of a doctor, removing them can be the best way to get rid of not just nearly all, but all of the cells to take away the cancer. All right, so somatic mutations that disrupt normal checks uh, on cell division can lead to cancer. Once these cells begin to divide uncontrollably, they're favored by natural selection. This is short-term natural selection. Uh, so this shows that evolution can be short-sighted. These cells are dividing uh, within the host, and natural selection acts on them this way. But in the long run, they're clearly killing their host, and they won't be transmitted after that. All right, so um, it's worth stopping uh, to discuss uh, this. Think about it. I, I would encourage you to think about it in case I have a question in this vein on the final or the third exam. All right, another observation um, in this vein is that the death rate from infectious diseases has dropped dramatically. And um, we live in an age where we've shifted, where most infectious diseases, uh, particularly in the Western world, in the developed world, are not that uh, dangerous. Uh, there are cases where we may be scared, but far few of a it's been estimated that over history, one in seven humans has died of tuberculosis. There are likely, many of you know, very few people with tuberculosis, and even in areas where it's flared up, such as prisons in Russia, uh, parts of Africa, parts of India, uh, and elsewhere, where there are the crowded conditions that favor tuberculosis. Even outside of those areas, far fewer people die of it than in the past, where it was one of the most widespread contagious killers of people. 
Other diseases like smallpox have been entirely eradicated, and some like polio are, are very close to being eradicated. And even others like measles, uh, despite the best efforts of uh, anti-vaxxers, uh, are largely controlled. And they do flare up, unfortunately. Um, but uh, if, if people followed vaccination, they would work. So it's clear that due to a variety of means, we've gotten much better at medicine. If you look at where the first uh, antibiotics were used uh, in the 1930s and early 40s, uh, they, they were miracle drugs and they saved a lot of people, particularly in the Second World War. But death rates were declining far below that, far before that. Uh, and even before 1900, death rates were going down uh, dramatically as uh, the cholera outbreak of the mid-19th century in London showed, people got pretty good at tracking how diseases were transmitted and starting to stop them, and instituting social policies that greatly limited uh, the spread of diseases. And, and even in the Middle Ages, as uh, the Black Plague uh, spread through Europe, uh, cities quickly learned that things like quarantines were actually quite effective uh, and would, spread, uh, would stop the spread of diseases. So th this decline is remarkable. The 1918 influenza pandemic, notwithstanding, uh, still there have been great declines and improvements in hygiene. And arguably, these come with a, their own challenge for the modern world. <coughs> in the modern world, uh, particularly in the wealthier Western world, we have far lower exposure to pathogens, and not just uh, contagious bacterial diseases, but um, different intestinal microflora, um, we have relatively low, uh, relatively high antibiotic use, uh, low exposure to animals, uh, almost no helmets uh, or sort of intestinal worms, uh, generally good sanitation. And this may drive things like allergies, food disorders, eczema, uh, and other sort of, sort of um, immune malfunction diseases, even possibly things like lupus. Uh, so it, it's possible that living without pathogens, as many of us do due to hygiene and other practices now, may actually in its own way make us sick, it makes us far less sick than exposure to those pathogens did. We have far longer lifespans uh, and, and in many ways far better medical care uh, than people uh, exposed to these things. And I, I use these words with uh, quotes intended um, so as not to... Um, yeah, well, um, there are certainly drawbacks to a Western way of life. All right, so one of the most uh, prolific diseases uh, caused by the Western lifestyle is diabetes. And this is one of the two or three greatest medical challenges we will face over the next century. As the U.S. Uh, ages uh, and hopefully remains uh, moderately um, economically well-to-do, uh, we'll see increasing rates of diabetes. It's already clear that well over a third of Americans are overweight or obese. Uh, and these are really shocking, shocking statistics with a range of consequences. Uh, but it's possible that part of the susceptibility, which does vary, some groups of people, such as African Americans, some Latinos and Pacific Islanders have far, far higher rates of susceptibility to diabetes than other populations. And there may be factors of uh, economic well-being that may affect that, but there also appear to be good evidence that there are some genetic susceptibilities. And this may have to do with the thriftiness of one's metabolism, which may be in part genetic, in part phenotypic, uh, or in part based on the diet of one's mother. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting research going on in this area now. All right, so, um, yeah. The way in which we interact with bacteria and parasites uh, is important for proper immune function, and there may be consequences to clean environments. Exposure to nutrient-poor conditions uh, during pregnancy, uh, during the mother's lifespan, or early in life can have can alter physiology through life and may affect the sort of a starvation mode uh, that can be quite costly in a westernized lifestyle. Finally, uh, we share a lot of similarities with other animals. We have deep homology in the genes in our uh, immune network with uh, not just other 
mammals or vertebrates, but even with insects, invertebrates, and uh, yeast. A lot of the genes and how we respond to diseases are deeply shared. And that means we can learn a lot about how we deal with disease by studying model organisms to which we're rather distantly related. Uh, and it can give us insight into um, new diseases, into drug treatments, or into other effective controls. We need basic research to inform the medical practice. And doing away with basic research is a very poor investment in the long run. All right, so uh, I've already asked for your final minute right. No need to do this. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all soon.